From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back. I'm very pleased to say welcome back to the last episode of the first season of the Cannabis Podcast. We've been doing this together for uh, almost a year now. The first episode we posted last December 1st, almost, or just a little less than a month and a half after cannabis was legalized in Canada. That was the spark that got me started. A whole lot of things have happened in the last year. We're going to talk about a few of those, cover some of the interesting things that we touched on in some of the episodes. Not going to dive into too much detail on that, but just kind of a look back, a retrospective look back. In addition to that, I have a great story that explains a whole lot what went wrong in the last year with the cannabis rollout. In fact, the government was told how to do it, but they chose to ignore those rules. And we're going to touch on that story as well. Since we started out down this path together, and my goal was to provide a whole bunch of cannabis education as I, if I could, make people more aware of the plant, the, the wonderful properties of this plant we call cannabis. I mentioned some weeks ago that I had been asked to participate in a community center education on cannabis session. It was a local community group, and the group was the Gallagher's Healthy Living Club. Jan Mills was one of the members of the Gallagher's community here in the Okanagan. She was the one who sparked all this, who organized it all. She has been using medicinal cannabis for a number of years, and she was the one who sparked this whole education process. I also met her husband, Martin. He was there at the seminar. Nice to meet you, Martin. That happened this last week. They held their meeting. There was myself and a doctor from UBC Okanagan, uh, Dr. Joan Bortoff. She did a talk on medicinal cannabis, and I did a talk on recreational cannabis. And I thought, since that's what this whole podcast got started on a year or so ago, that that's probably not a bad way to finish the first year. So the last piece of today's show, I'm actually going to do the speech that I did for that community group, which is Cannabis 101, with some of my own fed into that piece. And hopefully you'll enjoy that as well. So thank you. Welcome. I'm glad you came here for episode 33, the final episode of the first season of the Cannabis Podcast. So let's take a look back. It was December 1st, 19... <laughs> no, it hasn't been going that long here. You can tell that I might have imbibed a little in prepping for today's show. <laughs> Maybe a little too much, perhaps. It was December 1st, 2018. That was the very first episode that we posted. And that was the episode where I interviewed Ian Power, who was the first person, uh, arguably so, to buy that first gram of cannabis back in Newfoundland at 12.01 a.m. on December, or on October 17, 2018. Really enjoyed that interview. That was the very first one. Then we talked to a, a friend of mine who also was sparked after legalization to do something he'd always wanted to do. That was David Wiley. David started OkanaganZ.com, a marijuana media company. And there's a bit of a follow-up to that. In fact, they just published their first print magazine of Okanagan Z. So David continues to do well and, and doing lots of things. We chatted with a, another friend of mine who also happened to be a medical practitioner of Chinese medicine. And that was an interesting discussion with Michael Cote as he talked about trying some cannabis that he had been gifted. We talked to another gentleman from Newfoundland. And if you remember that, that was Thomas H. Clark, who has been in the news lately because he was running. No, he was not allowed to get a bank. That's the problem he's run into since we started all of this. He had to move to a cash-only business because in Newfoundland, he couldn't get a bank to support his THC or his cannabis business. Interesting, isn't it? So much has changed. So much has remained the same over this last year. Probably one of the biggest changes from the podcast perspective was in and about episode number 10 or 11. We started out doing strain explains. As you may remember, I'd pick out a strain and offer some opportunity of what I thought that strain tasted like, felt like, and all of those sorts of things. And then as my education of cannabis continued, realized that strain was more reflective of a virus, like a, literally a medical virus, as many people were starting to talk about. And that's where the whole concept that I first learned of cultivars, a cultivated variety. Stop calling them strains. Let's call it a cultivar. And lo and behold, that's when Strain Explain very elegantly morphed into Cultivar Corner. 
Of course, I have to thank my son Ian for the creation of the Cultivar Corner jingle. In honor of the fact that he did it, I think we need to hear it again. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. I still love listening to that, and I promise I will work my best to try to get another cultivar that we can take a look at next week. So that has been some of the things. I'm not going to go through all 32 episodes because you can do that yourself, but it has really been a great experience for me this last year since starting this podcast back in December. The feedback that I've gotten from you on the things that you're enjoying, the things that you like hearing, and I guess the biggest, the thing that gives me the biggest impact when I hear from people who are listening to the podcast, and that's the amount of information that I try to put out each week. Try to give you just a ton of information on cannabis, its evolving or its evolution in our country, how the laws are changing, how cannabis itself is changing. And that's probably what gives me the biggest bang when people respond that they love the information I put out and they're enjoying the, they're enjoying the prospect. They're enjoying listening. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a member of the Cannabis Podcast family. I'm going to continue to do this. I guess that's the other change. We started out doing weekly episodes. And I was really eager on that. I really, really tried to get an episode out every single week. And then I became a bun tender. I started working again on a daily basis, a full-time job. And that meant that I did not have the time to do this. And well, I I probably could have squeezed it in somewhere, but after having a toke, I didn't feel like I had the time to do it. So that made, it went about probably midway through the year, we switched to every second week. That's why the first year has 33 episodes. I realize that's kind of bizarre in terms of the timing. Next year, it'll probably be 26 is what I'm thinking, because we'll continue to do it on a bi-weekly basis. I think that's worked. That's certainly worked from my perspective. It's made it easier to put the whole podcast together, get the information. Still looking to do lots of interviews. Again, info at Cannabis Podcast is the email address. If you want to touch on anything, we did do also a, a, a ad hoc survey over where people are getting their cannabis. Not a ton of entries came through in that, and I, th- I realized that probably it's an anonymity thing. That because I was asking you to send me an email, you didn't want to have your email tracked, all the rest of that. So I think to follow that up in a better way as we move into season two, I'm probably going to set up one of those Survey Monkey things, put a link to that on the Cannabis Podcast uh, website, and we'll do it that way so people can do an anonymous report of how they're buying their cannabis. Anecdotally, Most of the stuff today is still being purchased on the black market, although it's probably a 40-60 split somewhere around there from the responses that I got. Really interesting, though. I love hearing from you. If you ever have a comment about the show, please send me a note. Info at CannabisPodcast.com. From the Cannabis-Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Now, one of the things we've talked about all along since we ever started uh, doing the Cannabis Podcast was what was happening with legalized cannabis in our country? How, how badly did it get screwed up in trying to bring, bring this to fruition? We've touched on it a lot in the last 33 episodes, and uh, yeah, they kind of screwed up. Uh, so this was an article that I, I was first clued into by a, l- a listener on Reddit in the Canadians subreddit group. They posted the link to this article, which is from a CBC. And it's a story by a fellow by the name of an analyst by Don Pittis. And Don has really hit the nail on the head. And I'm going to read some of his article here because I think it really puts things into perspective of what this last year of cannabis legalization in Canada has been and what it could have been. So new rules, effective December 16th, will come just in time so you can leave a cannabis-laced cookie or beverage out for Santa. But if the struggling Canadian pot business is looking forward to Cannabis 2.0, as the availability of vaping products and edibles has been dubbed, they will likely be disappointed if they expect it to be a Christmas present that will solve their financial problems. The sector that was so recently a stock market darling and then attracted small-scale entrepreneurs like moss to candle flames has suddenly fallen on hard times, as heavier cannabis users who make up the bulk of sales simply don't patronize the legal market. The legal industry that only months ago worried about a shortage of the drug is now facing a glut. Established players seek new sources of cash as share prices fall. Experts predict a shakeout in the industry as small players, unable to find buyers, begin to fall. 
The numbers vary across Canada according to how each province has managed their own legalization rollout, and boy, is that ever true. But statistics show the vast majority of cannabis users still get their pot from what police sources recently called a strong, vibrant, dark market out there selling illegal drugs. While the legal industry battles to grab market share from their illicit competitors, economists could have told them this would happen. And not just could have, economists did tell them. In April 2017, long before cannabis became legal on October 17, 2018, economist Rosalie Winoch, a policy analyst with the C.D. Howe Institute, was one of those who had a warning the government's expecting to get rich from legalized pot should have listened to. If the government taxes marijuana heavily, she wrote in an open letter to Bill Blair, the federal cabinet minister who led the way on cannabis pot policy, it will ensure the continuation of the black market and will be undermining its efforts to control the substance. Of course, revenue wasn't the only thing motivating government policy that helped keep pot prices high. Before legalization, health experts worried that legal availability and low prices would lead to a flood of new cannabis users. Gee, that didn't happen, did it? That pessimism from the health lobby was the mirror image of optimism from the cannabis industry and its investors, who foresaw Canadian smoking up a storm. But as it turned out, both sides were wrong. While there was a small uptick in purchases immediately following legalization attributed to law-abiding Canadians trying the drug for the first time, for the first time in a long time, they feared and hoped for deluge of new users just never came. The latest figures from Stats Canada show cannabis use has been relatively static, with a few heavy users responsible for most of the consumption. Not talking about me, are they? And while legal pot shop assiduously check IDs to make sure patrons are of legal age, the continued existence of a huge and thriving black market means younger buyers can get all they want from illegal dealers who, in Ontario, for example, still control something like 80% of the market. Now, in that province, if the government had actually been trying to help with the illicit market flourish, it would have been hard to do a better job. If we had one store for every 10,000 people, which is the rule of thumb, in Ontario, we would have something like 1,500 stores. And we only have 24, said cannabis business analyst Chris Damas on the phone from his home in Barrie, Ontario. Here in Barrie, which has a lively drug culture with a population of 150,000 people, there's no store, said Damas. So why would they want to drive to downtown Toronto to get some marijuana that was legal? Damas says a high government excise tax and other expenses means prices are about double what people can get from their local dealers, including home delivery. And as we move from the article and just into general comments about this last year in legalization, here's the other thing that's happened. With each province taking a different approach, the end result in the retail world has been completely different across our country. Here in B.C., although they say they have released 100 licenses now and they did it in a bad rush, we're still striving for or thriving for more legal stores here in the Okanagan. The city of Calgary, or Alberta in total, has 300 stores, apparently. I don't think we're ever going to get that close here in the Okanagan. But that's clearly part of the problem. That's why the black market is still thriving. Please, please, governments, listen. Get more retail stores open. Lower those prices, lower those taxes so the price can come down and we can truly have a market that's going to give some competition to the black market. Not only are we dealing with still stale and old product, but at elevated prices and with lots of taxes associated to it, it's no wonder that it's still thriving on the black market. But let's hope by the next time we come to the conclusion of the second season of the Cannabis Podcast, we're no longer having this discussion. Let's hope that by that time, stores are open everywhere, the legal prices have come down, more and more people are using the legal markets to get their cannabis. That's my hope. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big hope, but I think it's a doable one too. So let's look forward to that at the end of Season 2 of the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And now... I want to share with you something that I was involved with at the Gallagher's Healthy Living Club this last week here in the Okanagan. It was a crowd of oh, probably about 80, 85 people who were gathered in their auditorium for the night. I'll be honest, it was mostly a gray-haired situation, and they would admit that as well. It is a retirement community after all. And those were 80 very attentive people 
and I really enjoyed the experience. I really enjoyed sharing my story with them. And so now, if you don't mind, to finish off episode 33 and season one of the Cannabis Podcast, I'm going to recreate that speech for you now. Let me give you a sense of who I am. What's my stake in the game? What has brought me to this particular point in my life? For me, 1972 was a pivotal year. Did you ever go to a party when you were 17 years old? I'm going to assume that most of you raised your hands. <laughs> I did. Now, did that party that you attend affect the rest of your life? Well, it did for me. In 1972, when I was the, attending a party in Williams Lake, now this party was happening at a local park, some fool had left a beer bottle on top of his vehicle in the parking lot. And that meant that the local police saw that vehicle and decided that they needed to interact with this party. Came by, and guess what? They searched every single person who left that party. I had completely forgotten about a tiny little cannabis pipe that was in the pocket of my jacket. Now, in fact, I thought I had lent it to somebody to use that night. I didn't realize they'd put it back, but they did. The police found it, and I found myself in the back of a police car for 30 minutes being interrogated about that pipe. At the end of the night, they let me go. I thought I'd dodged a bullet. Until six months later, when a police car showed up in my driveway while I was at home babysitting my little brother one day after school, and the officer then proceeded to tell me that I was about to be charged with possession of cannabis resin. They scraped a half a milligram of cannabis out of the bottom of that pipe, and now they're going to charge me with possession for it. And that was the day that it changed for me. That was the day that the absurd laws for this plant that I enjoyed so much, I could no longer support. That's the day I became an advocate and a proponent for the use of cannabis. And in 1972, I was not alone. In fact, there had been meetings held right across our country. They started on the East Coast, worked their way to the West Coast, the end result being that the Ladane Commission declared that cannabis should be legalized in our country. Now, unfortunately, the Trudeau, who was prime minister at the time, chose to ignore that. He had to have a son, and we had to wait 45 more years before that to actually happen. But it finally did, and now you understand my stake in the game why I am so passionate about this plant, and why I love sharing the education with anybody who's willing to listen. So let's talk about that education. Why is it that cannabis affects us? Well, it's really a simple answer. It comes down to the human endocannabinoid system. Within that system, there are a series of receptors, both CB1 and CB2 receptors. Now, these receptors are protein molecules that live on the side of the cell, and they interact with other proteins and the interaction is dependent on whether it's CBD or THC. And it is that interaction, for example, with the CB1 receptors that we get high, all the CB1 receptors in our brain. Now, I'm not going to dive deeply into the endocannabinoid system. You're welcome to research it on your own. For the purposes of our discussion, we're really concerned about a couple of cannabinoids. And not only a couple of cannabinoids, but the different types of cannabinoids. Within your own body, there are the endocannabinoids. These represent pretty closely what THC and CBD do, but they're designed by and for your body. Anybody ever had a runner's high, for example? You, you did that real big exerting workout and you, and you got that buzz? Well, that was because anandamide, the endocannabinoid like THC, sparked a dopamine outburst to give you that feeling of euphoria. That's an example of endocannabinoids and how they work. The endocannabinoids and then the other one that exists, of course, are the phytocannabinoids from the plant. Tetrahydrocannabinol, and cannabidiol, THC, and CBD. Now let's look at the different types of cannabis. And for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to refer to them as land race strains. And a land race strain is something that has not been genetically modified any further. It is the way it exists. And the original indicas came from Tibet, Afghanistan, Morocco. Indicas, as we know, are a, a low, bushy plant. Here in the Okanagan, outdoors, they tend to grow four to six feet. And the indica for you to remember, of course, is that body relaxation, that deep stone. 
When we look at the sativas, well, they're from equatorial regions. Colombia, Mexico, Southeast Asia. And the high is a lot different. It's uplifting, energetic, a cerebral high, best suited for, certainly in my perspective, daytime use. And as we also noted over the course of this last year on the podcast, some people mispronounce that sometimes. It is not stevia or satvia. It is sativa. And here in the Okanagan, the sativas, as we found out last year, can grow as high as 13 feet when they're planted outdoors. And the third type of cannabis that I want to talk about is ruderalis. It's one that many haven't heard about, and that's because it comes from central Russia. It has low THC, and it's hardly ever used for recreational purposes. But for the purposes of this discussion, now you understand that really today, the cannabis that we're dealing with is on a spectrum. There's indica on one end, sativa on the other, and in the middle are hybrids. And that's where ruderalis really plays an important part as we look forward to the future. As we've already indicated with those sativas growing in the Okanagan, they got ripped off out of the garden because they were so high. They could be seen. People knew they were there, obviously. Next year, auto-flowering indicas, which have utilized some DNA from the ruderalis to keep their profile low to the ground, three to four feet high. And the real beauty is they generate flowers about every seven to nine weeks, depending on the variety or on the cultivar. That's the plan for next year. So by the time they come to steal them, there will be no plants left. <laughs> I can just put up a sign. Sorry, too late. Those are the plants. Let's look a little more at the actual plant that we smoke and, and what gets us high and where the magic is in that. So when we're looking at a bud of cannabis, it's the frosty nature that we're looking at. Those little gleaming crystals that are on the top of that bud. And if we take a closer look at that, it's the trichomes that we're, we're interested in. The trichomes is where all the magic is. The trichomes hold all the cannabinoids, CBD, THC, all the other cannabinoids, plus another essential oil that we've talked a lot about on the Cannabis Podcast over this last year, and may be new to many people, and those are terpenes. An essential oil molecule that gives cannabis its flavor, its smell, and its effect. And for those who might be growing in the Okanagan, as I've heard that many people in the community are, those trichomes are also going to be your clue as to when it's time to harvest. They start out clear, then they move into a milky nature, and then you'll start to see some ambers showing up. And once you get a certain percentage of amber, it's probably time to start harvest because your THC is starting to go down. Now, I mentioned one thing there that I want to talk about a lot, a lot further, and we certainly have over the last year on the Cannabis Podcast, and those are terpenes. We've covered them in fair amount of detail, and for the purposes of this talk, I wanted to settle on one particular aspect of the terpenes, and those were the aromas, the part of the terpenes that makes our cannabis smell. And when you are smelling a particular cultivar of cannabis, this one, for example, is an Acapulco Gold, so it has a little citrus, there's a bit of floral, and there's definitely some pine. To explore terpenes a little bit more, I'm going to concentrate on one particular one, myrcene. We've talked about myrcene a lot. Myrcene is the most predominant terpene in cannabis. Not only is, the, is it the most available, it shows up in most of our cultivars, but myrcene also has a unique property in regards to our CB1 receptors in that it lubricates that for the other terpenes. Myrcene is also found in hops, and it, many people think it gives it the skunk smell of cannabis. And it's also in mangoes, as we've talked about before. Eat a mango 45 minutes before you imbibe some cannabis that has some myrcene. And because it has lubricated those CB1 receptors, you'll get a better high. Another terpene that I want to just touch on briefly in this discussion is related to the floral scent that you may pick up in your cannabis. Often in that floral nature, you're going to find that it's linalool that is the terpene. Lavender and other flowers also contain some linalool. It is a good for anti-anxiety and as a sedative, so it will definitely leave you in the couch, which is, of course, what indicas will do for you. So those are the terpenes. We've looked at those, the trichomes where they're all held, the cannabinoids that help to enjoy the experience as well. Tell you what, let's get stoned. Ah, still one more thing we have to do. With that raw cannabis flower that's in front of us, it has many properties of its own, but it is not psychoactive. In fact, right now, it is tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, THCA. It has no psychoactivity associated to it. 
In order to get some psychoactivity, we have to turn it into delta-9 THC. And how do we do that? It's a process called decarboxylation. And I always love talking about this word to a new audience because it's such a big word. Decarboxylation. A lot of syllables. It really just means we need to heat our cannabis in some form or fashion. Whether we're doing it in a joint, whether we're using a herbal vaporizer, or whether we're going to cook it in the oven and get it ready for some edibles. Now, another topic that often comes up at this stage as well is how do you know when you're stoned? Because sometimes it can creep up on you. And I should have prefaced this discussion by saying I am going to repeat a few of the stories that you may have heard previously on the Cannabis Podcast, and this is one of those. The first time I had somebody ask me how they'll know when they were stoned, it was my sister-in-law, Caroline. It was at a wedding, I think in Oxbow, Saskatchewan, some years ago. She had seen us go in and out of the hall a number of times, and on the third exit, she came along and asked if she could join us. Well, we of course said she could, because... Cannabis users are nothing if not friendly. She came out and joined us. She had five or six hits off of that first joint. Over the course of smoking that, she asked, how will I know when I'm stoned, Gary? I said, well, it's an individual experience, Caroline. Everybody has a different experience, so I can't really say for you, but just, just go with it. I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to figure it out. We went back into the hall. She took a powder break into the washroom. A couple minutes later, she came out and she walked immediately to the head table where the bride had laid down her really pretty sparkly shoes down on the floor. Caroline picked one of those shoes up, and she's staring at it adoringly in the middle of this hall. I walked up to her, tapped her on her shoulder, and said, Caroline, if you're standing in a dance hall on a Saturday night staring at a pretty pair of shoes, there's a good chance you're stoned. <laughs> and, and I'm really pleased to tell you that Caroline is also a listener to the podcast, and she still sees the humor in that story as well. So let's talk about some of the other ways to get high. Inhalation is, in my opinion, the best way for you to dose your cannabis. I know there are lots of people that like edibles. We'll talk about those in a bit. So we're going to talk about inhalation consumption methods right now. Maybe you want to smoke a joint like Caroline and I did. That's going to deliver 5 to 10 milligrams of THC for you. And here's now where we also introduce the concept of time to effect. So when we imbibe cannabis in some way, shape, or form... How long is it going to be until we start to feel the effect? When we are inhaling it, it's generally three to five minutes once you've taken that into your lungs, held it there for a bit, and then three to five minutes before the high starts to show up. If you are a chronic toker, like many listeners are, you're probably going to need a bong. The bong is going to deliver 20 to 30 milligrams of THC. That's why many chronic smokers use a bong, because they need that big hit of THC to give them the effect that they're after. Perhaps you're going to look at a pipe, same as I did when I was 17, and hopefully you won't get busted for the resin in it. That'll deliver 5 to 10 milligrams of THC. With concentrates coming to the fore in just a little less than a month now, around December 17th, some may hit stores, probably next year in reality. But with concentrates, use a dab rig, drop that concentrate on it, that again is a Big, big hit. 15 to 30 milligrams of THC that one hit is going to provide. And I had fun talking about this one on the golf course in the Okanagan, the vape pens. Very discreet if you're looking for some discretion when you're on the golf course, for example. But as I mentioned there, it is isolated THC. It doesn't have all the cannabinoids, all the entourage effect that I really like from smoking a joint. And then my favorite method of inhalation consumption is a herb vaporizer. And I made a real point because the doctor who was doing this talk that I attended, her last slide said you should not vaporize. She was talking, of course, about the e-cigarette vaporizers and some of the vape pens, like I already discussed, and you know my opinion on those. I made a real point of making sure that the audience understood that the herbal vaporizer I'm talking about is simply you put your herb, your flower, on top of a ceramic heater and you draw the air across that ceramic heater. There's no carcinogens. It's easy on the lungs. You get to taste your cannabis. I strongly support that as being the best method of inhalation consumption because, again, it allows you to control your dosage. Now, we talked about a couple of other methods as well, topicals and tinctures. A lot of people looking towards those topical skin creams for their arthritis, their tendonitis, any number of skin ailments that will help. 
Generally, those contain both THC and CBD. And I've had many people go to purchase some of those and be concerned because there's THC in it. They don't want to get high. And the response is just simply to let them know that because the it does not penetrate deep enough to hit your bloodstream, there is no psychoactivity with it when applied topically. And then we talked a little bit about tinctures. A tincture, of course, can have CBD, THC, or any combination of that. And as close to inhalation, this is one of the fastest methods of ingestion. The time to effect is 5 to 10 minutes. First of all, you hold it under your tongue for 2 to 3 minutes, let your saliva distribute that to your bloodstream. And then in 5 to 10 minutes, you'll start to feel the effects of that tincture application. And then the conclusion of the talk was looking at Cannabis 2.0. Edibles became legal October 17th, as did concentrates. Those are expected to show up in stores around December 17th. Probably not before that, because what you may not be aware of is Health Canada, once it was made illegal, they now had 60 days to look at any company's example before they would allow it to for sale. That's why December 17th is the earliest you're likely to see that. The big difference here with edibles is the time to effect we've already talked about. If we're inhaling it, it's three to five minutes. If we're doing a tincture, it's five to eight minutes. Now with edibles, because now the liver is involved, <laughs> it's 30 minutes to two hours. That's why dosing for edibles is so hard to do, because that time to effect is so irregular. And the other issue, of course, that happens with edibles, as I already mentioned, it goes through the liver. That means there is a further transformation of THC. We've talked already about THCA, tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, becoming delta-9 THC and therefore becoming psychoactive. Well, once the liver metabolizes that THC, it changes again. This time, it's 11-hydroxy-THC. And the important part of that is, it's way stronger than Delta-9. Not only is it six times stronger than Delta-9 THC, this is the biggest factor. It's also very, very unpredictable. That means taking a dose of edible one week, using that exact same dose the second week, you feel either absolutely nothing or you feel way more than you expected. You got to a green out faster than you wanted to. Case in point. There was a fellow I worked with at the store where I was a bud tender. He was in his 70s. His 95-year-old mother sent him to work one day with some brownies, some THC brownies she had made. He shared them with everyone at the store. I think we each got three of them. I went home that night, had one of those brownies, and I was really looking forward to a fantastic experience. And I got to tell you, it was absolutely boring. I felt nothing, not a, not a buzz, not a, not a blimp. Went into work, found out that everybody else had had a blast with their one brownie. So I came home that night and thought, well, I can do this better. It's obviously a dosing issue. So I did two. And that was my mistake. As mentioned before on this podcast, I have never been more psychotically stoned than I was that night. I spent two hours trying to move my mouse to watch a video. Then I spent two further hours trying to figure out how I was going to get back upstairs. I was in a severe green out, and if you have not experienced, having too much THC in your body from edibles can literally start to shut down certain systems. Walking can be difficult. But here's what you need to remember. If that happens to you, it's not life-threatening. It will end. You may have heard that bit, the uh, RCMP, or not the RCMP, police officers down in the States who called 911 after they had eaten some stolen edibles. And they thought they were about to die because time was going so slowly. The green out will end, but it can feel very, very bad when you're doing it. So my advice, as edibles come to market within the next month, please, please, please go low and go slow. The moment I was charged with possession of cannabis resin was the moment my passion for this plant and my determination to fight against its stigma was born. I will spend the rest of my life fighting the stigma that says medicinal use is okay, but recreational is not. And I will also continue to produce episodes of the Cannabis Podcast with that same theme behind it, trying to break down the stigma that so many people still hold about this wonderful plant that we call cannabis. And that wraps it up for the final episode of the first year of the Cannabis Podcast. 
Again, if you have any comments about the program, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. Have anybody you think we should interview in the next year? Any cultivars you think we should add to Cultivar Corner? Any of that information, please send it along. I'm thrilled to have you here as a listener. It's been my pleasure to be doing this for the last year, and I will continue to doing this as long as I still see there's somebody out there listening. And that about wraps up episode 33 of the Cannabis Podcast. In the Cannabis Infused Studio. High above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast.